Um, why don't we get started? This is kind of loud. Can you turn this down a little bit? I feel like... Or, or maybe I'll just put it lower. That's what I'll do. I'll lower it. Yeah, I'm good. Um, so last... I talked to you guys about neuroimaging. And so what I thought I'd do this class is uh, tell you guys about a study um, or a set of studies that we did in, in my lab that uses neuroimaging and some computational modeling to kind of give you an idea of um, how these techniques are used and some interesting things, um, interesting questions you can answer um, with them. Um, so I said, as I said before, uh, my lab is uh, interested in understanding how incentives uh, influence performance. And um, one facet of that that we, that we looked at recently is how um, large incentives um, can sometimes lead to this paradoxical case of poor performance or, or choking under pressure. So to give a, an idea or an example of this, we can look at this video. This is actually Roberto Baggio in the 1994 World Cup. Um, at the time, he was the, the, uh, the best footballer, supposedly the best footballer um, in the world. And uh, he, he was playing for Italy, and Italy was playing Brazil uh, to, uh, in, in the final game of the World Cup. And if he scores his penalty kick, um, they would win uh, the World Cup. So let, let's see how he did. He's taken these kicks thousands upon thousands of times. So, so he has a great ponytail. That's the first thing to note. But also, he couldn't even put it on the net, right? So he's taken this kick thousands upon thousands of times, but something happens in his brain that causes him to choke under pressure and not even perform the skilled motor task with which that he's been, you know, trying to master his entire life. So why is it that this happened? And, and this, this is a fun example, but you can also think about cases in which you choke under pressure in sort of your daily life, maybe on the first exam, right? Or, or, um, or, or when, when you're performing in front of people, like when I'm talking in front of you guys. So in my lab, we're trying to understand why is it that, that there are these cases when incentives can get really big that you, you might choke under pressure. And the, the, it should be noted that in economics, the, the thinking is that increasing incentives, so if you see here, will sort of lead to increasing performance up until a certain point, and then people will asymptote. So the thinking that economists has, have is that people are rational. You just have, pay them more and more. They're going to get better and better up until the maximum of their ability. Okay, um, And so basically the idea is that Inse increasing incentives lead to increases in effort and motivation, which lead to increases in performance, right? But what's been found in the field by some behavioral economists is that this, that actually that if incentives increase, you get better only up until a point, sort of this medium range, and then for higher incentives, you tend to choke under pressure. So basically, increasing incentives increase effort and motivation, and sometimes it can get you to do better, and other times it can get you to do worse. And so the experiments that were done to do this, uh, to, to come up with this finding, economists actually went to India where they could afford to pay people percentages of their yearly salary um, to do different uh, tasks. And what they found was that in these real world settings, if you pay people to do these tasks and you pay them real, a, a lot of money, they tend to, to choke under pressure. But it's, they, they didn't really come up with sort of a neuroscientific reason as to why this happens, okay? What, what was suggested by them and by others in psychology is this idea of over-motivation. So basically, the incentive makes you over-motivated, whatever that means, um, and that's what gets you to choke under pressure. But basically, there's a poor neuroscientific understanding of skilled task performance for incentives. We don't really know what that over-motivation is and why it gets Roberto Baggio to choke under pressure or, or other people to choke under pressure when they're doing certain tasks. And that's, that's what we're trying to figure out. And one, one region of the brain that we thought could be involved in this is this area in blue here that's sort of deep in the middle of your brain called the ventral striatum, which is made, of the nucleus, made, made up of the nucleus accumbens and the ventral parts of putamen. So this area has been shown to encode reward values. So if I just show you a reward you could and show you increasing rewards, ventral striatal activity tends to increase with increasing reward value. What's also been found is that this area sort of mediates 
uh, motivated responding for incentives. So if I tell you to do something for a certain incentive, this area tends to light up and is related to both your motor performance and the incentives that are offered to you. Okay, so we thought that this could be an area that could be re responsible for that choking under pressure phenomenon. So I said before, ventral striatum encodes rewards and punishments. It's involved in regulating instrumental motor responses, so how you just sort of make simple motor responses uh, to approach or avoid different things. And it mediates the effects of rewards on increases in motor performance. So if I offer you an incentive to do something, ventral striatum encodes both the action that you're taking and the value of that action, or the value associated with that action. So what we wanted to ask was, what are the neural mechanisms underlying paradoxical performance for incentives? And the way we, we did that is we, um, we wanted to create a task that was novel to subjects and that could be standardized in terms of its difficulty across participants. So we wanted to bring people in, have them do a skilled task that was novel to them so that everybody could sort of start on an even playing field. And then we could look at how variance in their performance for incentives um, was uh, um, how, their, how their performance varied with those incentives when they were sort of standardized at that difficulty level. So to do this, we put people in an MRI scanner. So that's what this is here, um, a huge magnet essentially. And we scanned their, um, and we tracked their hand movements um, with some motion tracking cameras. So these cameras allowed us to attach a sensor onto their hand and then we could sort of visualize how they moved in the scanner. So we had people making reaching movements in the scanner, track their hands while they were doing a task that consisted of controlling a spring mass system. So basically what they saw was a hand cursor, which is here in white. Um, so as they move their hand, this white cursor would move. And it was attached to a mass, a virtual mass in yellow via a spring. So as they move their hand, this mass would oscillate back and forth. And their job was to get this, both of these cursors into this uh, target area. Okay. And the reason we chose this task was because it was completely novel to participants. It has a completely foreign set of physics to them. So we could basically teach them to do this task, um, have them learn it, and everybody sort of starts at the same difficulty level, right? And then we could standardize that difficulty level and figure out how their performance varies um, with incentive from that, from that difficulty level. Okay? Does anybody have any questions so far? And so on the first day of the experiment, what they do is they'd come in and they'd put both of these, they'd have two seconds to do the motor task and they'd basically be told, you know, you want to put both of these cursors into this target area, okay? And they did this over 500 trials. So they had a lot of trials to learn and get really good at it. Here there are no incentives involved. It's just to get them good at the task. And so what you see here is performance before learning. You can see they're really bad. So their job was to put both of those cursors into the target, um, but it's, it's very challenging when they're, when they're first starting off. After learning, you can see that they're able to sort of skillfully put both of those cursors into the target, okay? So they get really good at it over, over the course of learning. And so what you see here is data from that, from that training phase. So, oops. So as, uh, as trial number increased, you see performance here, performance sort of asymptotes, they get really good, um, and they're, they have this significant improvement in performance um, af after learning. So what we can do is, what we can show is that as you, as you learn more, we can get you really good at the task. But what we're interested in is how you do um, for incentives. Oh, actually, I forgot to mention one thing. We also did a thresholding. So to, to standardize difficulty, we showed people different level, uh, different sizes of targets and fit a psychometric function so we could figure out where everybody had 60 and 80% success. That way we can have everybody at standardized difficulty levels depending on their performance, okay? So we basically give them um, varying target sizes, fit a psychometric function, so this is target size on the x-axis, performance on the y-axis, and we choose the hard level as being 60% success, a target that gives you 60% success, and an easy level as one that gives you 80% success. And we can make sure we get those, those levels specific for each subject because we've done this thresholding, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? And then for the, 
for the incentivized task itself, what we do is we have them come in the next day and we tell them that they're going to play for money and trials can vary between zero and one hundred dollars and we tell them we're going to extract one trial and and pay you depending on your performance on that single trial. So what they see is the incentive they're playing for, the same tasks that they've trained on, and the outcome of whether they won or lost. And since we're taking one trial at random, it's, their be it's in their best interest to do their best on all trials, is, is the thinking, okay? Um, and so here you see the incentive resulting in peak performance and just the frequency at which that happens. So what you can see is that over the easy and hard difficulty levels, people sort of reach peak incentive over the range of incentives, right? There seems to be a lot of variability in which people reach their maximum, um, maximum performance for a given incentive. And so if we sort of standardize and, and just look at low, medium,